Okay, so in this video, we're going to be taking a look at a whole bunch of different hypothesis tests. We're going to work through our five steps, and we're really going to work as we go through these examples, figuring out, hey, what's my null, what's my alternative, and really identifying all the parts as we work through. Uh, like I said, most of your marks in hypothesis tests really come from the setup, and so that's really going to be our focus as we work through this, is how to properly set up these kind of questions. So let's go jump over let's take a look at our first question and just launch right into this so first guy here again with all of these what i really recommend pause these before i even start working through them maybe for the first one watch how i work through it first i don't know but after this definitely pause them attempt to work through them on your own unpause see the results that i get and see if you agree with it so okay Let's go, let's start, let's take a look at it. So, okay, we have a 2012 survey revealed that the average American spends $21 per week with a standard deviation of 575. Sorry, $21 on coffee per week with a standard deviation of 575. Okay, so right there, that's kind of our population kind of information. If I wanted to break that out, I would say right there, that's all my population information. And how, what kind of gave me the clue for that? Because my next line then says a random sample of 40 college students spent on average 1925. Right? So, okay, I'm now having my sample. Technically, this isn't until step five. So we can almost ignore this for the time being. Final one, this is really what I'm interested in. This is my setup. Test using a 3% significance level if college students spending on coffee is any different from the general public. So, okay, that bit there, this any different from the general public, that's my big takeaway that I wanna take a look at. So step one, stating our null, stating our alternative. So H1, uh, sorry, null, H0, alternative, H1. Okay. So first thing I need to figure out, what's my parameter of interest? Am I dealing with means or am I dealing with proportions? Well, okay, right here, study revealed that the average, okay, there we go, we have it, means. So population parameter is my mean. From here, we spent on average 21. So this is what I presume that it is. So what I can do is I can just write that in. I don't even know what's going on with it yet, but 21, I'm asking something about the mean and 21. Okay, my actual question, test whether the level of spending by college students is any different from the general public. So that is, I'm not asking our college students spending more. I'm not asking if they're spending less. I'm just saying, hey, I believe I want to test whether or not this is different from 21. That is just not equal to 21. My null then, my null is going to be equal to 21. What's my level of significance? Like I said, this will always be given in the question. I have a significance level of 3%, so 0 0.03. Step three, right? So that's step one. Step two. Step three, state our test statistic. Well, okay, we're dealing with mu. We have a sample of 40, so we can appeal to our central limit theorem. And I have a population standard deviation, right? This standard deviation was attached to my population mean, leading me to believe this is a population standard deviation. So all of that says this is a Z. That will be X bar minus mu all over sigma X root N. So first three. Step four, formulate my decision rule. So, okay, if I want to formulate my decision rule, I'm going to draw my distribution here. I'm dealing with the distribution of X bar, normally distributed, right, because I have a sample size of 40. Drawing that down, what do I have? My null is saying 21. And I am looking to my alternative now. I just have this statement of not equal to. That is maybe left, maybe right-hand tail, I'm not sure, such that both of these tails together, well, that entire red area is 3%. But okay, it's two-tailed, so that is going to be 0 0.015 in that tail, 
0.015 in that tail, half of my significance level in each one. We're going to want to standardize this to a Z. So X bar to a Z. There we go. So what is my critical values? Well, to find these critical values, I need to find out first what is in that middle part. And so keep in mind, if that's 1.5% in this middle part is 0 0.485 or 48.5%. So what I'd want to do is I want to go jump over to my table. And as I go jump to my table, I want to look up in the middle there, 0.485 or the closest to it and pull out my corresponding statistic. So let's go and take a look what we can find. Uh, we have exactly a 0 0.4850, and that corresponds with a Z statistic. That's our critical value, our Z critical value of 2.17. So uh, let's keep the same color going on here. That'd be 2.17, 2.17. And I could express explicitly my decision rule to say if, that's a negative, if the absolute value of that Z that I calculate is greater in magnitude than 2.17, I will reject my null. Alternatively, I could write this in terms of my p-value, and I could say if my p-value is less than my significance level of 3%, then we will reject our null. So, okay, I've explicitly written my decision rule in both ways. And so, right, so far, so far, if this was a test situation, that would be one mark. That would be one mark. Writing your explicit decision rule in both ways, that would be one mark. Finally, step five. This is where we actually go and we start doing some calculations. Everything up until now has just been set up. So step five, we're going to go and we're going to be, right, step five. This is where we actually get our sample. We have N of, sorry, N of 40, and X bar of 1925. I want to take my step three. I want to put these values in. I want to figure out, hey, where is my Z statistic with respect to my critical value? So I go and I calculate this. Z is 1925 minus 21 is my population mean, all over my standard errors. So I had a standard deviation of 575, all over the square root of 40. So, okay, working through that, we have 1925 minus 21. That gives me negative 1.75 in the numerator. 575 divided by the square root of 40. That's going to give me 0. Point, we'll carry on a few extra decimal places here. 9092. So that yields for me. Ah, 1.92. Negative. Negative 1.92. So, okay, let's take a look at this negative 1.92. This is not enough on its own. We need to know what we're doing with this. So 1.92, negative 1.92, sorry. There's my cutoff, negative 1.92. That's going to be sitting somewhere around like that negative 1.92. So, hey, right there, I'm not in my rejection zone. So I would say, therefore, I will fail to reject. If I wanted to, I could also work out a p-value for this. So I'm not going to do this for all the questions, but first one here, just to make sure, hey, you didn't go any farther. Let's make sure we at least get the p-value taken care of in this case. So how we'd calculate the p-value, keep in mind what the p-value is saying. Under the assumption that our null is true, what is the probability we witnessed the result we did or more extreme? So essentially, I want to go and I want to find out, hey, what is 1.92 or more extreme? That is, I would want to find out what this yellow area is. 
what is that yellow area underneath the curve? So how do I do this? Well, I go back to my table, I look up 1.92. So let's go do that. We look up 1.92, 1.92 gives me 0.4726. So that is there to there, 0.4726. Okay, that's not the area I'm looking for though. I'm looking for out in the tail. So to get the tail, I recognize that this entire half is 50%. So 0.5 minus 0.4726, that yields from negative 1.92, more extreme, 0.0274. So probability of witnessing the result I had or more extreme is 2.74%. Now, okay, again, keep in mind, don't freak out. You're like, oh, but Keith, we have conflict. Negative 1.92, that's a fail to reject. This p-value, that's less than 3%. That seems like a reject. Keep in mind, two-tailed test, we need to times this by 2. Because we're not comparing this to 1.5%, we're comparing this to 3%. So our true p-value in this case here, our true p-value is going to be 2.74% times 2, or sorry, 0 0.0274 times 2, which would be 0 0.0548. So that is, we have a p-value, a probability of witnessing the result we had, that is a sample mean of 19.25 or more extreme, assuming this is true. The probability of that is 5.48%. That's bigger than our Significance level, therefore again, we fail to reject. Keep in mind again what the p-value tells us. P-value tells us the weight of evidence against our null. The smaller the p-value, the more evidence against our null. The bigger the p-value, well, the less evidence against our null. This again really brings in the importance of stating our significance level ahead of time before we work things out. Because if you were in a situation where you wanted to disprove this, right, you really, really wanted to reject your null. Well, if you really wanted to reject your null, now that you know the results, you could change things and you could say, hey, hey, I'm going to set my significance level to 6%. And hey, by changing your significance level to 6%, Oh, your p-value is now less than your significance level. You would now be rejecting your null. But keep in mind, you've just messed everything up. You've figured out your results, and then you have changed your whole experiment in order to get the outcome you wanted to get. That's biased. That's subjective. That is giving you really bad results. That is the whole reason why we set our significance level right back here in step two before we know what our results are so that we set it objectively rather than subjectively. So important thing to realize with that. Okay, that's our first question. Let's jump on, let's carry on. Again, same thing holds. We'll take a look at this next guy here. Recommend you read through it first. You try to figure it out, work your way through it. I'll pick it up and I'll carry on with it after. So take a second here, see if you can work this guy through on your own. Okay, so in this case here, after failing to obtain a majority government, there is pressure for the Premier to resign as party leader. In a random sample of 200 voters, 40% favor the Premier remaining as party leader. We want to test at the 1% level of significance whether the proportion of voters who support the Premier is less than 50%. Okay, whole bunch of information there. Let's start off by just going through our five steps. So, step one. Step one, state our null and alternative. So null, alternative. First thing we need to identify with our null and the alternative is what is the population parameter we're interested in? Are we interested in our mean or are we interested in a population proportion? Well, in this case, we have nothing in the question about standard deviations. We have a whole bunch of percentages. And in fact, it says right here, proportion. So yeah, I'm gonna go with that we're dealing with a proportion. So I'm asking some question about the true population proportion. What, what exactly am I asking here? 
Well, typically our question is phrased in the alternative and typically it's that last one there. So let's take a look. Test at the 1% level of significance whether the proportion of voters who support the premier is less than 50%, right? Less than, that's an inequality, that's the alternative. So I want to say, hey, is the true proportion less than 50% versus my null that in fact it is going to be 50% or more that actually still support the premier. Okay, step one, good, done. Step two, state or significance level. Test at the 1% level. Okay, significance level, done, 1%. Three, what is my test statistic? Well, okay, I'm using a proportion. So if I'm using a proportion, my test statistic is going to be Z, and that is P bar minus P all over P1 minus P. So that's going to be the test statistic that I will utilize once I get to step five. Step four, formulate my decision rule. Okay, so if all my conditions are met, and we'll have to check this, but if all my conditions are met, P bar will be normally distributed, centered around what my presumed population proportion is, 50%. And I need to figure out then what is my what is my rejection region. So that is I have this one percent rejection region. Where am I putting it? Well, again, for this I go to my alternative and I say, okay, I'm looking for a proportion that's less than fifty percent. So okay, less than fifty percent. That's going to be less than fifty percent over on my left, and I'll put in a rejection region here of one percent what i need to do is i need to figure out what that critical value is that's attached to that so i need to go from a p to a z so in order to do that we need to find out what that what that z value is and that z value there well if one percent's in that part there this is 0 0.4900 over in the main bowl so to find the Z value, I'm going to go to my stats table and I'm going to try to find 0 0.4900 or the closest I can in that bulk of the table. And so going through, looking at it, there's no exact 0 0.4900, but there is a 0 0.4901. That's pretty darn close. And that's at negative 2.33. So, okay, negative 2.33, that's my cutoff, that's my critical value. And so I could explicitly state my decision rule if I get some z when I calculate this less than negative 2.33, I will reject my null. Again, I can phrase this in terms of my p value. I can say if I get a p value, less than my significance level, so less than 1%, then I will reject the null. So two different ways that I can explicitly state my decision rule. Both of those guys there, so what do we have so far? You'd have one mark. You'd have one mark. Both of these guys, one mark. Finally, step five, this is where we're actually going to go to the question. We're actually going to start working through things. Up until now, strictly set up. So step five, we pulled out a sample proportion, and we're going to need to know what our sample size is. So what did we have here? 200 voters. So in a random sample of 200 voters, that's my sample size, 40% favor the premier. So, okay, 40% are in support. 0 0.40. Okay, we now want to take this guy. We want to work out what that corresponding test statistic is, compare it to our critical value, and then make our decision. Let's calculate. Z is 0.4 minus 0.5 all over the square root of 0 0.5. 1 minus 0.5 is going to be, again, 0.5, all over, uh, what was my sample size? 200. Okay, so numerator, I get negative 
Denominator, oh, what do I get? 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 200. And then take the square root of all that gives me 0, 0.0. I uh, will carry around a few decimal places here. We'll say 354. That's action, in case you were wondering, 35355, five, five, but we'll, we'll cut it a little bit short. We'll carry around a few extra decimals. That gives me, that's going to give me negative 2.82, uh, yeah, we'll round that up to 2.83. The rounding of it isn't actually going to influence our final result. Negative 2.83 versus my critical value. In either case there, I'm going to say, hey, that is smaller, therefore I will reject my null. That is... I'm going to go to my alternative and I'm going to say that, hey, yeah, this is pretty strong evidence to say that we don't have majority support, to say that the true support for the Premier is less than 50%. Uh, let's go through. Let's go through one more time. Let's figure out our p-value in this case just because it is a little bit different. Again, it doesn't explicitly ask for it, but just the same, let's calculate that. So for my p-value... Well, what we're taking a look at is we are taking this 2.833 and we're saying, okay, that's going to be somewhere about, I don't know, making it up, maybe something like that. Negative 2.83. What we're looking at is the probability of witnessing negative 2.83 or more extreme under the presumption that our null is true. So what's the probability of 2.83 or more extreme if that is true? So to figure this out, we go to our table and we look up the probability of witnessing between 2.83 and the mean. So we go, we look up 2.83 and that gives us 0 0.4977, 0 0.4977. Okay, but this is not the area we're looking for. We're looking for that tail. So 0 0.5 minus 0.4. 4977 and that gives us our p-value one tailed test it's just times by one it's fine as it is 0 0.0023 so very very unlikely result if this was true so we would have our p-value of 0 0.0023 so hey that's clearly less than one percent Again, therefore, reject the null. These two will always be in agreement, right? If ever you get a situation where they don't dis where they disagree with each other, a case where they don't agree, you've made a mistake, right? You've made a mistake somewhere along the line. Mathematically, these two will always agree with each other. So it's a good check for your work. So, okay, you've calculated your Z, you've made your statement, there's your final mark. Or if I asked you to do it by p-value, you've calculated the p-value, you've made your statement, that would be your final mark. Either way, in step five, you've figured out what your test statistic is, and you've determined whether or not you reject or fail to reject your null. Okay, let's carry on. Let's take a look at the next example here. So again, take a look, see if you can work this out, have a pause, and then pick it back up and see where we're at. Okay, so in this case here, assuming grades are normally distributed with an average of 65 and a standard deviation of 15, you are trying to determine the difficulty of an upcoming class compared to others. You survey nine friends who have taken this class before. Between them, they have an average grade of 60%. We want to test at the 10% level as to whether or not this is proof that the course is more difficult than most. So, okay. No alternative step one, right? And don't get lured into the question. This is always it. Yes, we have a question. We have all this information. I see it all the time. People get excited. They want to start jumping in and calculating stuff. Don't do it. Just get, stick to your five steps of hypothesis testing. So step one, what is our null? What is our alternative? Okay, first thing for our null versus our alternative, we need to know, hey, is this mu? Is this p? 
right? What is our population parameter? And in this case here, average, average, uh, standard deviation, all of that, that's what we need for mu. So we're dealing with a mean and average in this case. What we're looking at in this case here is we want to test at the 10% level whether or not this is proof that the course is more difficult than most. So, okay, we kind of need to decipher what that means. If this class is more difficult than most classes, well, you would expect them to be having a lower grade, right? That's really what you're trying to infer in this case. So if it's more difficult, you would have a grade lower than, well, lower than what? Well, we assume that grades are normally distributed with an average of 65. So that is, we would presume that they would have a class average lower than 65% if this was harder than normal. If it wasn't harder than normal, well, in fact, grades would be equal to or greater than 65%. So we have our null, we have our alternative. Step two, state our significance level. Well, right there, test at the 10%. So significance is 10%. Step three, state our test statistic. What is the tool we're using from the toolbox? Well, okay, to go and take a look at that, we're dealing with mu. So, okay, we're going down that route. It could either be a Z or it could be a T. The determining factor of that is whether or not we know the population standard deviation. So what do we have? Assuming grades are normally distributed with an average of 65 and a standard deviation of 15. Okay, that's all our population information right there. Same sentence, population average, population standard deviation. So population standard deviation, that is a Z. X bar minus mu all over sigma X root N. So I have my test statistic. Step four, assuming I can appeal to the central limit theorem, Right, and in this case here, we've assumed that the grades are normally distributed, so X itself is normally distributed. I'm pulling out a sample size of nine. Yep, I'm good. I can appeal to the central limit theorem. So X bar normally distributed, centered around, I believe, 65%. That's my null, at least. And what am I wanting to do? I'm wanting to figure out where this rejection rule goes, so I'm going to put 10% somewhere. Well, my alternative is where I look to for where I put that. I'm saying, hey, maybe that mean is less than 65%. So if it's less than 65%, I'm going to test, hey, this guy here, do I get some value over here with a 10% rejection? 10% rejection, well, okay, X bar to a Z. I need to figure out what is that Z critical value, and keep in mind the way I do that, if this is 10%, this guy here is 40%. So I need to go to my table, I need to find 40% or the closest to, and find the corresponding Z statistic. So going to do that, I go look at the table, look through, look through, and I get negative 1.28 as that critical value, right? That's not exactly 40%, but it's 0.3997. So it's about as close as I can get. So negative 1.28. Now I need to explicitly state my decision rule. So explicitly stating that, I'm gonna say if I get some Z value less than negative 1.28, I will reject my null. I could also express this in terms of my p-value. I don't ask for the p-value in the question. In this case, I'm not going to do anything with the p-value, but just for you to see, we would say that if the p-value is less than my significance level, so less than 10%, I will similarly reject the null. So again, just remind ourselves, that's one mark. That's one mark. These two, that's one mark. Finally, the last two, that's going to come from question, or not question, but part five, which is actually deciding what's happening. So what do I have? I need to know X bar, mu, that's going to be 65%. I need to know sigma X, uh, what was that guy? 
0 0.15, and I need to know my sample size. So, okay, I sampled nine friends. Oh, X bar, what was X bar? Sample nine friends, their average grade was 60. So that was the result of my sample. Okay, so let's put all this information into our test statistic, into our tool, and work out what our corresponding test statistic is. So Z is 60% minus 65% all over 15% root nine. Okay, so I get negative 5% up on the numerator, and then I get 15% divided by root 9, giving me 5% down there. I get a Z statistic of 1.00. So, okay, where does that fit in? 1.00, well, if that's 1.28, 1.00 fits right there. There's 1.00, that's not in my reject region, right? That is not less than negative 1.28. So I would say, therefore, I fail to reject. That is to say, these nine friends who I surveyed, even though they had an average of 60%, that is not strong enough evidence to suggest that this course is harder than most. It's not extreme enough. Of course, I'm not going to go through it, but you could work out the weight of that evidence. You could work out the p-value. That is the probability of witnessing 1.00 or more extreme. You could then compare that to your rejection rule here with respect to the p-value. I should be a little bit more clear. That's not p. That is p-value. gets confusing if you just use p. Are you talking about a population proportion? So p-value. But again, it doesn't ask for it. I've gone through it in the first two cases you should have the idea how you could work through it here as well. Okay, well, let's go take a look at yet another one. So again, pause, read through this, see if you can get it on your own. If not, we'll pick it up, we'll work on it together. So historically, on average, 20 people show up to class where attendance is thought to be normally distributed. Surveying between the first and second midterm, eight classes, we had an average of 16 students with a standard deviation of 4. We want to test at the 5% level whether or not this attendance is lower than typical. Okay, so a whole bunch of information. You might be like, what is going on? I am lost. Don't worry, right? Stick to your five steps. At the very least, just by setting up, you can get 60%. So let's go to our five steps. Let's work this through. Step one. State or null, state or alternative. So, okay, stating the null, stating the alternative, what is happening in each case here? Am I dealing with a mean? Am I dealing with a proportion? What is my population parameter? Well, okay, big keyword, on average. What else do I have is I have a standard deviation. So, okay, there we go. This is dealing with averages. I am dealing with mu. Okay, and what am I asking? On average, 20 people show up to class. So, okay, that's gonna be something I'm asking. My population parameter is 20, and I wanna test at the 5% level whether or not this attendance is lower than typical. So, hey, is this lower than 20 versus greater than or equal to 20? Step one, done. Step two, I want to test at the 5% level. Step three, okay, what is my test statistic? We know we have a mean, so we're either going Z or we're going T. The distinction between the two is, do I know my population standard deviation? Okay, what do I have? Historically, on average, 20 people show up to class where the attendance is thought to be normally distributed. Okay, so that's kind of my historical population information. I have nothing about a standard deviation in there. Next sentence, surveying, so I'm taking a sample between the first and second midterm, so I'm surveying eight classes, sample size of eight. We had an average of 16 students, that's my X bar, right, X bar, with a standard deviation of four. Oh, 
This standard deviation is attached to this X bar, which is attached to the sentence talking about my survey, my sample. So this is my sample standard deviation. So in this case here, I will be dealing with a T. T n minus one, we could update that. Well, let's just leave it as it is. T n minus one, X bar minus mu, S of X all over root n. So first three steps. Step four, let's formulate our decision rule. So formulating our decision rule, X bar, in this case here, I'm T distributed, looks the same though, right? Still looks like a bell curve, centered around my null, presumed to be 20. And I wanna say, where am I putting this 5% rejection region? Well, to get that, I look to my alternative. And again, in this case here, I'm saying, hey, is the mean actually less than 20? So again, I'm left side tail. So left tail, I'm gonna put 5% in that tail. So there we go, that's 5%. And that means 45% are over there. Need to standardize this to get my critical value. What am I standardizing it to? Well, I'm standardizing it to a T. And this is where we need to know what our T is. We have eight classes. That is, we are doing a T7, because this is N minus one. We surveyed eight classes. So, hey, T8 minus one, T7. What we need to do now, we need to go to our T table. From our T table, we're gonna look up for a 5% significance level. So that area in the tail being 5%, we're gonna go down to seven degrees of freedom. Alternatively, right, you can always look this up in Excel as well. You'll get more of an accurate result, but just the same, if you don't have that open, T table works pretty rapidly. So we get a critical value in this case here of negative 1.895. 1.895. So I can formulate my decision rule. I can say if I calculate a T7, which is smaller than negative 1.895, we will reject our null. If I wanted to go through the process of calculating the p-value, keep in mind for a t-statistic, I'd have to use a stat software like Excel or R to calculate my p-value. I could express it this way too. If the p-value is less than my significance level, then we will reject the null. But keep in mind, given that we're dealing with a t, you need to use a stats program. You need to use Excel or R in order to calculate that p-value. So again, not something we're gonna do here, but you could do it in the same way as we did before in our previous cases of finding areas underneath the curve. Okay, so working it through that. Step four, there's our final bit, right? Boom, four. So far, just from setup, that'd be one, that'd be one, that'd be one. Step five, working through this. Okay, so for step five, we're gonna pull for down the information we know. So we know that the mean is 20. Uh, what else do we know? We know that the sample size was eight. X bar, we have that up there is 16. And we know that the sample standard deviation is four. So okay, pulling our test statistic out we're gonna have our T7 equal to, uh, getting that mixed up, X bar minus mu, so 16 minus 20, all over sample standard deviation, 16 all over root four. Oh, nope, look at that. I'm looking at wrong numbers left, right, and center. Sample standard deviation, what was that? Sample standard deviation was four all over sample size of eight, so all over root eight. There we go, now things are working out. So that's negative four all over four divided by, square root of eight, giving 
for one. Ah, oh, we'll carry around a few decimal places for two. All together then, four divided by that gives me a T statistic of negative 2.828. Okay, again, keep in mind, this test statistic, this T value on its own is not enough. We need to interpret it. This guy, significantly smaller than that guy. If we were to put it in, if that's negative 1.895, negative 2.8, that's going to be somewhere all the way out there. Whoa, that really jumped. All the way out there. Negative 2.828. That's clearly in our rejection region, so therefore we would reject the null. Very clearly, that is out. We are rejecting our null. So we have that result there. Okay, let's carry on. Let's take a look at some more examples. Okay, last one here. Research in, okay, again, pause it, right? Just that heads up, pause it, read through it yourself, but let me jump into it. Research in the gaming industry showed that 10% of all slot machines stop working each year. Shorts Game Arcade has 60 machines and only 5% failed last year. Use the five-step hypothesis testing procedure at the 10% significance level to test whether these data contradict the research. Okay, so five steps. Here we go. Step one, stating our null, stating our alternative. Okay, null, what do we have? Are we dealing with mu or are we dealing with p? Is are we dealing with averages or are we dealing with proportions? Well, as I read through this, nowhere do I see average pop up. Similarly, do I not see standard deviation anywhere? So, okay, it would be pretty difficult to actually work out an average and work everything out without a standard deviation. Finally, everything is in kind of in terms of percentages. So yeah, I have that pretty strongly. This is gonna be something to do with a proportion. We have research in the gaming industry. So this is kind of the population situation showed that 10% of slot machines stop working. So there's something to do with a population proportion of 10%. Shorties had 5% failing, okay? We want to use the five step to test whether these data contradict the research report. This is a pretty trickly worded question. In fact, to be honest, I wouldn't actually love this question, um, but this is the nature sometimes as you get these questions that pop up from these external sources is maybe a manager, maybe a boss asks you this question. You have to interpret what exactly do they mean in this scenario? You're like, oh, but Keith, on a midterm where it really matters. No, 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 on a midterm where it really matters, I'll make sure they're really nice. Don't you worry. In this case here, though, does this data, right, test whether these data contradict the research report? So they're really hinting that we already have, we already have this data here, right? Because it's saying, does these data contradict the research report? So I would take this to be, hey, this is saying 5%, they're saying 10%, I would put it in this way here. And again, really shoddily worried, typically you wouldn't have these kind of results until step five, but sometimes you do, right? Sometimes you do. And in this case here, we are reflecting right back to the fact we have these results in order to see if they contradict. So I would say, hey, does this result of 5% contradict 10%? That is, I'm saying, is this population proportion actually less than 10%? So that's how I would interpret that again. Two, at the 10% significance level. So 10%. Three, while I'm dealing with proportion, there's only one option from proportion, and that's a Z. So that's P bar minus P all over P1 minus P. Okay, decision rule, well, if our criteria are met, if NP and one minus P are both greater than five, which in this case here, they would be, we would have P bar, sample proportion being normally distributed, centered around our null of 10%.
In this case here, we're looking at where we're putting this rejection region. In order to figure out where we're putting that rejection region, we look to our alternative. Again, every question I pulled out for this example, they all turned out to be left tail. That is, again, I'm saying, hey, proportion is less than 10%. So there we go, left tail. And in this case, I'm saying that guy is 10%. So this one is 40. What I need to do, I need to figure out what that critical value is. That is, I need to find out what that corresponding Z score is. So what that Z critical value, I'd go to my table and I'd look up probability of 40% or the closest to. So going to do that, 40% or the closest to yields for me, 3997 and that's at negative 1.28. So again, I can state this, if Z is less than negative 1.28, I will reject my null. Alternatively, I could phrase it in terms of a p-value. If my p-value is less than my significance level, so less than 10%, I will reject my null. So first four steps said, done. We haven't done anything yet, really. Now, step five, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where we begin starting to do some work. We pull this guy down, we start to solve it. So what do we need to know? We need to know P, P bar, and N. So, okay, P, that was 10%. P bar, that was 5% and N, N was 60 slot machines. So, okay, working through that, we have 0 0.05 minus 0 0.10 all over our square root of P, 10%, 1 minus P, so 1 minus 10% would be 90%, all over 60. So, 0 0.05 negative in my numerator and in my denominator we have 0 0.1 times 0 0.9 divided by 60. Take the square root of that answer and we get a denominator of 0 0.03873. Okay, so if we work that out, 0.03 divided by our denominator, we get negative 0 0.77. I'm going to go one more. I'm going to go say 775, but keep in mind, really, our Z values are typically only reported to two decimal places. So there I have my Z score. Again, what does that mean? How do we interpret it? Well, let's bring it back up to our decision rule. 0 0.77, that would be somewhere about there. That is, it is not less than negative 1.28. Therefore, given this, we would say, therefore, we fail to reject the null. So we have our result. We have our five-step hypothesis. If you have any questions as we've worked through these, right, we've done quite a few different examples. We've done some for our sample mean. We've done some for the sample proportion. We've done one tail tests, we've done two tail tests, and we've done a few times where we looked up our p-value. We've done it for the z, we've done it for the t. So if you have questions about any of these, feel free, reach out to me, make a post to D2L, or feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.